A big update from Bard puts AI in your Google Apps. Welcome back to the AI Breakdown. Today we are talking about the biggest conversation that we've had over the past month, which is of course Google versus OpenAI when it comes to the battle for artificial intelligence. But today we don't just get to talk in terms of new rumors or scoops from the information, although we do have one of those, of course. Instead, we get to talk about actual feature updates. At 9.15 this morning, Google CEO Sundar Pichai tweeted, We're adding extensions to Bard so you can connect it to your favorite Google apps, including Gmail, Drive, and Docs for even deeper collaboration. We're also updating how we validate the claims in Bard's responses with an improved Google It button and more. So let's dig into these updates and then go explore A, what people are thinking about them, B, how they relate to news from OpenAI, and C, what it says for the state of the industry. All right, so Google Post this morning, Bard can now connect to your Google apps and services, and that is the really big part of this. The company writes, one of the biggest benefits of Bard, an experiment to collaborate with generative AI, is that it can tailor its responses to exactly what you need. Today, they say we're rolling out Bard's most capable model yet. And the biggest piece of that is Bard extensions. With extensions, they write, Bard can find and show you relevant information from the Google tools you use every day, like Gmail, Docs, Drive, Google Maps, YouTube, and Google Flights and Hotels, even when the information you need is across multiple apps and services. Now, one of the examples they give is using Bard to help with the job application process. They write, you could ask Bard to, quote, find my resume titled June 2023 from my drive and summarize it to a short paragraph personal statement. What I think is really interesting about this is a couple things. First, in many ways, this is a personal version of the trend that we're seeing in the enterprise AI space as well, which is, of course, that if generation one of these tools blew people away just with the incredible capacities they had and the ability to help with things that technology just hadn't been able to help with before, the next generation feels very, very much about how much more helpful it can be if it has access to one's personal and private information. As we've discussed frequently on this show, this positions companies that enterprises already trust really well. Because if you are some big enterprise that's already dealing with the implications of new technology, not having to switch vendors or service providers and being able to just work with companies that you already trust with your data is a huge benefit. Similarly, those who use Google suite of tools tend to really use Google suites of tools. As a for example, at any given time, I have something like five Gmail accounts open. I actively use at least three different Drive accounts based on different podcasts and different projects. Whenever possible, I use Google Docs and other features that live in Drive as a way to organize and share information with outside parties. And so for someone like me, having Bard actually integrated with everywhere that I already keep my information around these businesses just seems like a very differentiated use case. Now that said, I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to use it for yet. Will it end up just being a more powerful search tool that actually can go across these different accounts? Or will there be new workflows that I experiment with that change how I do things now? I guess these are sort of the questions that everyone's asking themselves about AI in general. Now, the other part of this announcement is all about Bard's veracity and the ability for users to actually double check that the information they're getting from Bard is actually accurate. The company writes, when you click the G icon, Bard will read the response and evaluate whether there is content across the web to substantiate it. When a statement can be evaluated, you can click on the highlighted phrases and learn more about supporting or contradicting information found by search. Jack Krawcheck, who works on Bard, really emphasized this set of features in his announcement tweet about the new update. He writes, Bard now is the only language model to actively admit how confident it is in its response, and it admits when it makes a mistake. He goes on, Bard is the first language model to actively admit how confident it is in its response. Using the updated Google It button, you can now see confident claims in green along with a link, and lower certainty and even gasp when it makes a mistake in orange. These capabilities are coming worldwide in English to start. We'll bring more languages and partners soon. Now, Jack also points out one more feature which somehow gets buried because there's so much else going on which is that images and prompts and responses are now live in over 40 languages. In other words, there is a subtle but clear expansion of multimodality in this new update. Now, when it comes to what gets people on AI Twitter excited about news stories, it tends to be updated technological capacities. In other words, you're going to see a lot more retweets about the forthcoming Gemini, which might be able to outcompete GPT-4, than you will about a set of features that improve the usability of Bard. But when it comes to the day-to-day -day of actually using these tools, these types of integrations are hugely significant in how this battle is going to shake out. 
basically every company in the AI space that isn't open AI and that already has a relationship with customers is heavily leaning on the relationship that it already has with those customers to try to get a leg up in the AI battle. Certainly that is the case as we can see from this latest BARD update that sits inside this hugely popular suite of workspace tools, but it also seems like it's going to be a big part of Apple's strategy as well. The neural engine that Apple unveiled as part of their iPhone 15 event is being used today to help with a new gesture-based interaction system for the Apple Watch, but feels much more like an attempt to bring enough computing power to mobile devices to actually run powerful personalized AI models on device without having to mess around with the cloud. This is, of course, something that Apple has done over and over again in other sectors, but it seems like they're trying to bring to artificial intelligence as well. Now, I mentioned that this isn't the strategy for OpenAI because, of course, they don't have existing relationships with customers. They're starting from the ground up with the people who are using their tools, such as ChatGPT. Yesterday, in a surprise to no one, we got reports that OpenAI is behind the scenes working very diligently to try to get out ahead of Google when it comes to launching a multimodal LLM. John Victor from The Information writes, as fall approaches, Google and OpenAI are locked in a good old-fashioned software race, aiming to launch the next generation of large language models, multimodal. The information throws it back to its previous scoop from last week that Google is testing Gemini with a small group of outside companies. But according to Victor's sources, OpenAI is trying to get out their next multimodal model faster. Victor writes, The Microsoft-backed startup is racing to integrate GPT-4, its most advanced LLM, with multimodal features akin to what Gemini will offer. OpenAI previewed those features when it launched GPT-4 in March, but didn't make them available except to one company, Be My Eyes, that created technology for people who were blind or had low vision. Six months later, the company is preparing to roll out the features known as GPT Vision more broadly. The question, of course, is what took OpenAI so long if they had these features back six months ago? What amounts to an eternity in this highly contested AI space? One issue that we've heard in the past was reports that OpenAI had been hamstrung by access to compute, and so their plans to launch multimodal in 2023 had gotten delayed because of the overall AI chip shortage. According to Victor's newer reporting, though, there was also another issue. Quote, what took OpenAI so long? mostly concerns about how the new vision features could be used by bad actors, such as impersonating humans by solving captures automatically, or perhaps tracking people through facial recognition. But OpenAI's engineers seem close to satisfying legal concerns around the new technology. Now, the one more throwaway line around OpenAI's plans from this report was this, quote, OpenAI might follow up GPT Vision with an even more powerful multimodal model codenamed Gobi. Unlike GPT-4, Gobi is being designed as multimodal from the start. It doesn't sound like OpenAI has started training the model yet, so it's too soon to know if Gobi could eventually become GPT-5. If you are a regular listener of this show, you will know that I think that GPT-5 is primarily being held up by a regulatory process right now, in which OpenAI anticipates or maybe has been explicitly told that models that are more advanced than their GPT-4 standard are likely to be subject to some sort of licensing regime, even though that licensing regime is yet to be fully articulated. Now, the last interesting thing from this information article is just a reminder that to the extent that this battle comes down to multimodal, that could be a boon for Google. Specifically, they point out that Google has, through its ownership of YouTube, an incredible trove of data related to audio and visual information, and so might naturally have a leg up just based on that. As Rundown AI founder Rowan Chung tweeted, Rumor. Gemini is being trained on YouTube video transcripts. This is genuinely fascinating. The amount of knowledge and data on YouTube is massive. Can't wait to try it. So when will we learn more? Well, there was that announcement about a week and a half ago from Sam Altman that on November 6, OpenAI is hosting their first ever developer conference in San Francisco. He did go to pains to say that there wouldn't be GPT-5 or 4.5 or anything like that, but still he said, I think people will be very happy. Even before this, one of people's top predictions was that we would see a multimodal GPT-4 model. McKay Wrigley writes, some predictions for OpenAI's developer day on November 6th. Meaningful GPT-4 cost reduction, fine-tuning for GPT-4, UI for fine-tuning, multimodal GPT-4 goes live, DAL E3, ChatGPT API, rethinking of plugins. I bet I hit on at least three. You have to think after this reporting from OpenAI and just the general pressure from Google that multimodal GPT-4 has to be pretty high on that list. We are heading into a really interesting period in the development of LLMs. It's interesting from a business perspective to see if anyone can actually get to parity or even ahead of OpenAI, which has been the dominant force in the space since the launch of ChatGPT. It's interesting from a policy perspective, given everything that I was just saying about how models that are more advanced than GPT-4 seem like they might be caught up in a regulatory dragnet and a new as yet undeveloped licensing regime. And of course, there's also a really interesting technical question. Gemini seems poised to test the question of whether just making LLMs bigger does continue to improve their capacity. 
Insider yesterday published a piece, massive LLMs like Google's forthcoming Gemini could be a rare breed as generative AI enters a downsizing period. The piece says going bigger and bigger has looked like an unlikely path forward for some time, with OpenAI CEO Sam Altman suggesting earlier this year that, quote, we're at the end of the era where it's going to be these like giant, giant models. The reasons for that? One is the expense. For example, Altman said that the cost of training GPT-4 was more than $100 million. Second and thirds are concerned about data, in some cases hallucinations and biases, and in other cases copyrighted information. And beyond that, although not mentioned in this insider piece, there's just a lot more experimentation with where real gains are going to come from and whether it is exclusively based on ever larger training data sets. It seems likely that that's not the only vector that will lead to the leading models in the future. In any case, bringing it back to today's news, for anyone who is already an AI user and already a Google Workspace user, Forget all of that future Gemini versus OpenAI Gobi competition stuff. These updates are likely valuable right now. I know I am certainly going to experiment with them and I will report back on what I find. For now, however, that is going to do it for today's AI breakdown. I appreciate you guys listening or watching as always. And until next time, peace.